Welcome to Ira's Everything Bagel, where I talk with intriguing people about everything, their passions, pursuits, and points of view. My guest, Judith Peck, has excelled in several worlds as a sculptor, artist, and professor. Her current book is called Art and Social Interaction, a guide for college internships serving correction, rehabilitation, and human service needs. The book shows how college students can bring the freedom of expressive art into conditions of confinement and also learn about life. And it's published by Rutledge and available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all the usual places. And for everything about Judith's sculptures, go to jpecksculpture.com. And for everything about her books, go to iapbooks.com. And Judith, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Ira. I was intrigued with your background as well as your book. So before we talk about your book, let's talk about your spirit, your creativity, where you think it comes from. Well, I think it was inside of me all along, as it is in other people all along. Inside, there is just some people have more of a need to use it, to express themselves, and to uh, uh, make it part of their lives. It's inside me. It's organic. And uh, I just have to make my discipline comport with that so that I can take the time, the energy, and all, and eliminate some of the outside arenas of your life, you know, to be able to make effective use of that creativity. How do you do that? I've always wondered about that because I know a lot of creative people, I'll consider myself partly creative, and it's always a challenge to not get distracted with external, I'll call it conditions, and focus on what it is we we, we create people, or all creative people want to do, which is create. Well, you know, we've substituted creativity for a lot of other things. Uh, I think that we are very social creatures, you know, and so we need other people. And sometimes a loneliness pervades our life in such that we clutter it with uh, things like shopping and things like uh, uh, well, I can't tell you all the things that because I'm not interested in all those things. <laughs> we burden uh, that creativity. We bury it in some ways with a whole lot of rocks and dirt and grass and everything else around it, uh, the daily lives. Uh, and those daily lives, uh, those chores and errands and uh, indulgences uh, are very important. Uh, they make life happy uh, for us. But uh, if you have to create, which I do, and I think most writers and artists uh, have that need to do so, uh, then they have to find the time. They just uh, do a lot of things at once. I once thought when I was trying to finish my novel and always worried that I would die before I finished it. I think every, no every novelist on their first book thinks that they wanna just finish the novel before they die. I said to myself, having four kids at the time, that if I were to die, I would have lived four times as much as anybody else. So why should I, you know, worry about it and not be greedy? Well, uh, you, you mentioned having four kids. That again, now they, kids are, are can be a distraction, but they're also life. So you're responsible for four lives, and at the same time, you are creating, and you're finding time for creating. And now you have grandkids as well, but how do you juggle all of that? I guess I'm trying to get to the nub of how you produce as much as you produce. Okay, and I am still producing at this right wizened age. <laughs> it's not a have to thing. I have found a lot of creativity at raising those four kids very close in age. You know, I loved it. I absolutely enjoyed being a mother and being completely responsible for what they did and, and what they had. I remember trying to get, let's see, 10, 20, 30, 40 fingers inside of gloves to go outside. It was quite a chore with the first one not suffocating, you know, by the time you got to the last one. But it was, it was all such fun. And uh, it's just accepting it all. I think you accept it all and then you juggle it and you make it work. Uh, you always do two or three things at once. I've always told my students how to do that and ways in which to do that in the car, walking, walking to class, walking out of class, in class itself. Uh, sometimes you have to not, you are not focused. You might as well focus at that time on something that can be productive if you're not going to watch the teacher on her blackboard. So um, I think it's a question of accepting it all and um, enjoying it all uh, and uh, fitting in two or three things at once all the time. That's the main thing. 
Now, your advice goes contrary to the, the typical advice, which is that you shouldn't try to do more than one thing, that multitasking really is distracting you from focusing on one thing, and yet you're able to do it. Do you have any tips for people on how to do that? Especially if you're busy with a sculpture or you're writing a book or you're lecturing to a class, how in the world can you do other things at the same time? I think it's perseverance to tell you the truth. I think I just plod through with perseverance because I have no schedule. Uh, I do love the early mornings. Uh, uh, it's not so early by the time I get up, but those mornings looking outside and getting ideas and just letting the mind wander. You know, the prefrontal cortex is there for you to make conscientious decisions, conclusions, uh, and do uh, the organized correct thing. But you know, there's more than the prefrontal cortex. And when you let that go and you just take in your environment, the, the, the way those children of yours are moving and acting and talking and what they're saying and what they're doing and life all around you, the chipmunks, the squirrels, um, the, nature's changes. There is so much uh, life going on around you. Taking all that in absolutely creates a fertile environment for creativity. And you're not even aware of how much it does. Uh, it's inside of you and it always comes out at various times. I once assigned my students, their whole homework for the week was every day to lie down in front of some place near a window where you could see outside and do nothing but think. And it was at least three times a week they had to do this and just take in. Of course, and they <laughs> had to tell their mother or their father while you know, they were loafing in front of the window that they were doing their homework. But, you oh, know, yeah, exactly. it was successful. It was not as, I thought it would be as successful as it was with me, but it wasn't quite successful. They couldn't do it. They had to get those iPhones out. They had to make a phone. They just couldn't do it. And I don't know what it takes, uh, really, Ira, uh, to let others in on this. All I know is that it does work. What's the reaction, and I promise we're going to get to your book in a moment, but I'm just fascinated by your background. What's the reaction to your four children who are adults now to having this very creative, productive parent? I think they're all creative in their own right. Uh, they must have gotten it. I must have, I don't know, socked it into them in some way or another. <laughs> but they are all also caring individuals who are doing things with their lives to help others. Uh, that uh, I don't want to you know, go into detail how each one is doing it, but they don't see themselves only as an island alone. They have taken others in with them on that island. I either uh, in college, you know, uh, to join the helping group, the phone, the phone uh, line, you know, that uh, is a help line. Uh, and uh, my daughter right now is going to Ethiopia to do uh, to teach dance to people over there. She started something that has gone from Harvard to Yale to Princeton to U of Penn, uh, teaching children how to dramatize things in their life. Uh, so she's still doing that. It's amazing. Uh, uh, and the other is a builder, building communities for actual people. Can you imagine that? Build, building houses where people can work and uh, play and socialize together. So uh, that's very expansive. Uh, and uh, all of the children have been doing wonderful things like that. So it sounds like creativity runs in the family. Yes, it does. And do you, you mentioned earlier about being social. A lot of creative types, I think more in the realm of authors, but perhaps other creative types, uh, tend to want to be by themselves so they can either by their nature or by getting their work done, they're, they're in a silo by themselves. You're saying it, the, the better way is to be a social animal and be creative. Well, we're all social animals. I don't think people uh, really uh, perceive that sufficiently, Ira. They don't realize how compelling that natural phenomenon is that we are social animals. We need other people. And what happens is uh, we substitute. We do a lot of substitutions for that. And therefore we can feel very lonely and very depressed sometimes uh, because we don't accept the fact that we need to contact other people. And if we can't, as in my case, you start to write. What happened to me, interestingly enough, is that I always did sculpture from the earliest time. 
I was doing sculpture, but eventually my ideas would not fit on a pedestal anymore. So I started to make larger works, it's true, like the refugees, like the 20 foot Moses uh, and all of the other, I worked larger, but I realized I needed more of a narrative. And so that's when I took myself to a, a little luncheonette and I started to write. I started about my marriage, you know, and started to write. And that's the novel emanated from that and it went on from there. And I wrote three novels uh, accordingly. And uh, my nonfiction books, uh, were a result of needing more material for my classes. I wanted to uh, put in writing for them to be able to see clearly uh, the projects we were doing. So that's uh, why I started to write uh, nonfiction about art techniques. Mm -hmm. I occasionally okay. slip into a cliche question that I ask authors, especially prolific authors. And that is, do you see your works, and that would include the sculptures, do you see that as part of your immortality? I guess we all do. We all want to make a difference. We all want to uh, be more than uh, the body working on the planet, you know, uh, like ants going back and forth. I often look at the ants and I see myself. There. <laughs> I, see my, I see my mistakes all the time. It takes me now, I would say two or three times to do what I did once and sometimes four or five times and always with mistakes in, in between, but I'm very forgiving of myself. I talk to myself all the time. Judy, you really messed that one up, you know, try again, <laughs> whatever, because uh, we have to live with ourselves, enjoy ourselves and forgive ourselves uh, for the mistakes and for the things we should have done or done better. So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, uh, I believe self-acceptance is something interesting. My granddaughter has just, just, just today, she was Miss Wakiki in Hawaii, a very shy individual, extremely shy. She decided to go out and try to be a beauty contest. She's very beautiful and she's a dancer, terrific dancer. And she decided to do this. So she got to be Miss Wakiki. And just today she's, competing for Miss Hawaii. Nice. <laughs> we'll see. And so there you see something that you never thought, or you might've thought uh, it's a frivolous, you know, to go to a beauty contest, but she put herself out there with what she had to be able to overcome this tremendous self conf self uh, concern and, and shyness. And I, I, isn't that interesting? So we all do it in different ways. Yeah, that's fascinating. And you're right. I mean, you, you, Everybody does it in, a, in their own way, whether it's a beauty contest or writing a book or a sculpture or d joining a cause. We all have to grapple with our own, not demons, but our own sense of what we want to correct. So if it's shyness, here's what we can do. If it's some other situation, we'll work on it as well. So that's fascinating. And, and I want to give the self-confidence because without self-confidence, you can't proceed, you can't learn. And, and my books, try to do that in very specific ways. Uh, procedures are all in those books for elementary teachers and also for higher education uh, teachers when they're working with their students. Ways to impart that confidence so that you will say, geez, I'm pretty good at this stuff. What's next? You know, that's the important thing to do. Uh, so um, uh, anyway, that's where I like yeah, to get yeah. my uh, well, yeah. energies. Your current book, it's, again, is called Art and Social Interaction. It's a guide for college internships serving correction, rehabilitation, and human service needs, which is quite a mouthful. So, I know, it's much too long. <laughs> <laughs> How did you come up with the idea? And, and give us a sense of why you think art is good for social interaction and why you decided to marry it to college interns and putting them into a situation which is not a typical situation for college interns to be involved in. Okay, well, I'll tell you, it, the, the book derived from the program. The program started in the uh, early 70s. I instituted this program because I was on my way to the college to teach my classes, and I had just finished reading JFK's Profiles in Courage. And I was really impressed with it because I realized myself courage is what I need as an artist to create something new that has never been done before. You have to think you're a hot shit, you know, you have to think you're <laughs> okay to do that. And uh, most of us don't have that feeling, least of all me in, in terms of my being a middle child, you know, growing up, uh, you know, 
uh, anyway, so uh, oh. I want to go back into that. But the fact is- You can I, if you want, it's fine. No, no, that's okay. I was impressed with the idea of courage. And I said to my, how can I give my students more courage? And I realized that art can do that. Making art, making something creative, seeing it on the page, uh, working in three dimensions like clay and foil and foam and other things. You have something substantial in your hands and you can see that you've done something pretty good. And so uh, I can give my students that way through art. Then I began to think of all the people who are so limited by their situations, like incarcerated people in jail, like psychiatric patients who have the limitations of their brain functioning, the actual neural connections. They have no ability to make everything smooth uh, that they are thinking and articulating. And then of course, of all the people who are subject to abuse, uh, having been abused, uh, or else uh, dealing with abuse like drugs and uh, alcohol uh, and of course the other things like spousal abuse in the domestic shelters uh, and that sort of thing. And I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could use that magic mix of creative art making and student interaction, people who are young and vibrant, interested in making a difference, interested in helping, what a wonderful combination that is. And so I put it together to institute a course called Art and Interaction. Actually, it began by being called Art on the Outside. And uh, it, was, it lived in that uh, domain for many years. And then I changed it to Art and Interaction and the book, Social Interaction, getting much more into it. And it has been working. It's still ongoing at Ramapo College. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. And it's changed with the teachers. The teachers decide on different institutions and so forth, but it's ongoing every, uh, every year at Ramapo College in Mawa, New Jersey. Is the purpose of the book to spread it beyond New Jersey and have schools and universities and colleges take up that challenge and integrate art with interns and then into places where either a correctional facility or rehabilitation uh, situation. Yes, thank you so much for making that linkage because what does it do for students? It puts them one-on-one -on -one in contact with people who are in those situations and therefore they begin to become aware of the major domestic issues of our time, crime, aging, mental illness, drug abuse, spouse abuse, all those things we talked before, they suddenly become aware uh, of what these issues are in an intimate way, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, side by side, because our students in this program work side by side with uh, their constituents. So uh, you might uh, be drawing a tree, let's say on a page, and, uh, and, uh, and you talk about that tree in your backyard, and the other participant might say, yeah, I had a tree like that. I grew up with a tree and I sat under that tree with my boyfriend. Well, anyway, the idea of the image on the page will begin to uh, connect the two people together. And then you have that social interaction, that friendliness. Uh, the participant who's institutionalized suddenly feels powerful too. This person who they sort of look up to, you know, a college student, a, a pretty one or a handsome one because we have men and women in our class, young and vibrant and is interested in me. Uh, they are tremendously uplifted. The art is stimulated by that, but more so uh, their uh, sense of self, you know. We find them sort of getting dressed up for the next week, you know, this class. We find them taking better care of themselves. We find them wanting to put things on their wall, the blank wall. Uh, we find, uh, you know, a lot of anecdotal experience telling us that it's working, you know, this magic mix. <laughs> you actually mentioned something that I was going to bring up, which is the anecdotal aspect versus statistics. Are there stories of some of the people that your students or other students who are in this program, once they interact with these people, the clients, once these people get out of whatever institution they're in, do they use learn in the outside world or they in some cases maybe become artists themselves? I think they use it in one. Uh, are you talking now about the participants or the students or both? Participants. And then we can talk about the students. But the participants themselves, once they leave the institution, if they do leave, 
are they able, have you heard stories about them again anecdotally? Are they able to use that in their daily life outside or perhaps even become artists themselves? I, I wish, I wish to heck I had that information, but I don't because the people in the institutions are so busy. They're so busy with other things that uh, it's hard enough to get them to accept the program and to put the clientele in the program that is needed because you always have to have someone oversee it, someone sure. to collect the inmates and the, and the patients uh, and the frail elderly to come to the site to begin working. There is much that is demanded of them. In addition, uh, for example, in the jail, uh, to be able to risk the security of students coming in. I mean, they don't carry weapons, uh, the guards, they right. carry a, a stick uh, and a walkie talkie, uh, whatever the new technology is on that. So they don't know if a sharp pencil in their back is a weapon or not, you know, uh, or a pen uh, or some things that we may be using in the art activities, let alone the materials that the students are just bringing in and have to be approved you know, three-dimensional and other drawing materials. So the fact is there are a lot of problems in the institutions uh, and a lot of reasons for them to say no, uh, but it has to work for them to say yes. And as far as what goes on afterwards with the uh, clientele, I can't uh, ask for that, uh, you know, follow-up. I would love to, and certainly it's needed, but I, uh, it can't be had, unfortunately. Or perhaps some of those people that have left the institution would contact the program and would let them know that they really enjoyed it and they're doing certain things because yeah, of it. Oh, absolutely. That's what they do. Uh, they are <laughs> very much excited about it. They're, for example, Christmas is a very lonely time and all that. And the artwork that we do and all that from cards, we take little parts of cards and paste them on to a nice, uh, clean sheet of paper and then people can begin to uh, invent their art stories from what's on there. Uh, again, that's one of the spontaneous things we do. We never have people face a blank sheet of paper and start to create, oh, well, they'll ruin it, I'll ruin the paper, I can't. So that's one way to, to uh, have a negative experience. So everything, it maybe starts with the scribble and to find things in the scribble, or it starts with pasting something on there or sharing some things with other people uh, to get started. So we do that. But at this Christmas time, uh, they made a huge poster with lots of drawings. And on top of it was a great big slogan, Merry effing Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the females. Uh, so they were always interacting with our students in a way that they were, in a sense, feeling the pride and uh, forgetting where they were, in a way, for a little bit of time right. while the interaction and art making took place. Now, we talked about the participants, and then you mentioned, of course, the students, the student interns as well. Uh, what's it been from your uh, information? Again, this is anecdotal, but the reaction to the interns that have participated. Yes, in that is uh, a very strong uh, result. As a matter of fact, one of uh, the uh, evaluators in our site, because we were uh, funded for, after the first three years, it was picked up by the Department of Higher Education under Title I, and they funded it for three years. And so we we're able to get some evaluators who sat in on the classes and, uh, you know, who evaluated it uh, very conscientiously. And uh, Dr. Uh, Roger Johnson uh, uh, in TAS, Theoretical and Applied Science, did a study. He found out that 98% of the students found it to be the most relevant class they took in their college career. So that was something. Pretty impressive. Yeah. What our students are doing is fun, finding their families. Wow, they have a family that is really backing them up. And they have limbs, legs, and arms that can climb, you know, the big road uh, to the college and they can be free with those things. They have physical abilities they never appreciated before. They can hear well, they can see well. Uh, the things that the aging, the frail aging cannot do very well. And they found that they are able with their minds to decide on what courses they wanna take, what they wanna do. Uh, they have a gratitude uh, about the things and the situation uh, that, uh, that you find them in uh, that they uh, didn't have before. I'm particularly happy about the recognition of family uh, that they have from this course, you know, being subjected to these people who have so many limitations and so many things to surmount 
that they never even considered. You mentioned the elderly and the frail. So are, are a lot are some of these programs in nursing homes or in facilities where older people are that normally don't get exposure to the arts? The kind of exposure, unfortunately, in many nursing homes and assisted living situations and all that is product oriented. And I think this program uh, is very much process oriented. In other words, we're anxious that the process is evocative, that it draws from one's experience, one's memories. We deal with veterans too. And uh, although they may not have talked about the war experience so much, a lot of it comes out in uh, what they're doing on paper and three-dimensionally. Um, so uh, it, it's experiential. There's no macaroni pasting or anything like that. You would do no, no things that you could sell, although the inmates always like to sell something. And right. sometimes we actually can create products for that because we like to keep the institutions happy. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, but you know, uh, it, it's, it, it's all intended to make a person feel better about themselves by finding even in their, the limitation of the institutional setting which is extremely limiting. It is for a groups of people, not individuals, groups to be safe, groups to function, groups that the institutional representatives can function with and all that. So this program of art making is evocative, letting it come from the inside up so one can see one's inner personality. We have about a minute left and I wanted to get your sense of what you want to accomplish with the book for the next or immediate future or next five years. Again, it's called Art and Social Interaction, a guide for college internships for serving correction, rehabilitation, and human services. I never use a subtitle, so you don't have to try Thank to. you. I'll, I may check it out. I, yeah, I'm exhausted just reading it. <laughs> I would love to see social work and art professors take it on because the book spells out everything. I've even written the memos you have to write, you know, to the institutions, uh, the, the memos you write to colleagues from other departments because anyone in the school, business, social work, uh, law and society, uh, psychology, uh, any of the arts, music, theater, drama, writing, all of these can take part in this program to understand the issues of our time. Uh, and so I've uh, even mastered charts of how to arrange everything once you get it going. There's nothing that's left a chance. Uh, you can use that as a manual to start it easily. And also for volunteers in the community, perhaps the Y has, has a, uh, wanted to start a program someplace with people who have asked to you know, do some service in the community. So it's for them too. Uh, it's, uh, it deals with anyone who wants to help others in this society. And I'll tell you something, Ira, a little secret. Every once in a while, especially on a Monday, I wake up and I have a feeling of being low. Every time that happens to me, I get on the phone and call somebody who's in a nursing home or in some kind kind of an assisted living and all that. It might be, just might be a little up. And I arranged to visit them. And I am so uplifted. I'm uplifted by the conversation I have there. But right. it's still, it's amazing to help someone else in, in inevitably helps yourself. Well, that's a great way to leave it. My guest has been Judith Peck. She's author of Art and Social Interaction and then a bunch of other copy after that. The book, the book shows, <laughs> the book is published by Rutledge and available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble and all the usual places. So schools and institutions can find it all of all those places. And for everything about Judas sculptures, which I think you should all look at, go to jpecsculpture.com. And for everything about her books, go to iapbooks.com. And Judah, thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Ira. It was a pleasure. Pleasure. And join us every Thursday for a new schmear on Ira's Everything Bagel.